Hello, and welcome to my next episode of Systems Thinking, where today we will cover networks. So, a quick preface of today's video. We're going to start by talking about network systems. We're going to characterize them and talk about the components of network systems. Uh, in the second part of the video, we're going to talk about network effects, such as the behaviors and failures of networks. And then finally, we'll wrap up with a few examples of networks so that you can really get your feet wet uh, and, and be grounded in some, some real-world examples and, and start to apply your new systems thinking tools around networks. Okay, so first and foremost, network systems. What is a network? The definition of a network is simply internet, interconnected components and their interactions. So there's a few, uh, few things that go into this definition. First is inter interconnected components, so nodes or elements in a system. There are complex relationships between these different nodes. Uh, there might be different kinds of connections and feedback loops and other things that create aggregate or emergent behaviors in the networks. So holistic view. So one thing that you need to keep in mind is that a network is a type of entity that emerges from the collection of independent components. Uh, it is a kind of system that takes on a life of its own. Uh, there's some adaptability and other emergent properties that come from networks. So adaptability refers to a network's ability to change. Some networks are very, very uh, structured and rigid, while others are very plastic and uh, uh, changeable. That's what adaptable means. Moving on, nodes. So networks are fundamentally constructed of nodes. These are individual components or elements within a network that have their own individual uh, functions or identities. So let's talk about identities. The identity of a node is the, uh, the attributes that, uh, that basically define that node within the network. So that might be a person, it might be a computer, it might be a city in a network, it might be uh, an institution in a government. Each node has its own function. So in the case of this graphic here, uh, you might have an engine assembler. So as a node in the network that builds cars and engines, you might have someone who's responsible for bolting on carburetors. You might have another person who's responsible for painting the outside of the, of the car body, that sort of thing. Uh, connections. So one thing that you need to understand is that nodes are connected to each other. There's all kinds of connections that can go into this. It can be informational connections. It can be physical or material connections. Uh, so, for instance, in within the system of a car, there are many physical linkages, such as belts and chains, uh, that, that interconnect the different parts of the network, the system of the vehicle. In information networks, however, such as on the Internet, those, uh, those connections, those interlinks, are purely digital. They're only information. In financial systems, it is money that is, that is uh, the connection. You know, money moves from one account to another as part of financial transactions. Uh, local rules. So basically, the local rules are the guidelines and behaviors that dictate or characterize uh, the constraints and protocols that an individual node follows. So for instance, uh, as a lawyer, you have certain rules that you have to follow as a participant in the legal system, if that makes sense. And then finally, state. So nodes can change state. Uh, and what I mean by that is, say for instance, you're working in a large factory and a machine breaks down. So its state goes from operational to broken down or defunct. Um, in, a, in a longer term system, you might have things that are in different phases of their life. So life cycle state is another thing. So something might be brand new, it might be old, it might be time for retirement. And so I'm thinking in terms of software and hardware in those kinds of systems and networks there. Okay, so moving on uh, from nodes, we have interfaces. So another thing that you need to understand is the interface. So the interface is the linkage between nodes in a network. So there's different kinds of connections. Uh, this might be information, energy, material. Those are, those are the generally the three kinds of connections in any network. So in a computer network, the interface is all about information. So you might be sending data, you might be sending commands, API calls, or that sort of thing. In a power grid, uh, you're sending electrical energy. In other kinds of uh, in other kinds of networks, you're sending mechanical energy. So, for instance, a car um, that is a network that has uh, uh, mechanical energetic connections, and then of course across factories and delivering of of goods. So, like if you've got an Amazon van, um, there's material being moved through the system. Uh, so then the second part is directionality. So many interfaces are bidirectional. Uh, meaning like, say, for instance, I give you money, you give me a bar of soap, right? There is a bidirectional uh, interface there. Uh, in some cases, it's not. Sometimes it's one way. Uh, with extractive ne networks, you're basically, you're going into a coal pit, you're extracting coal, and you're not putting anything back in. Um, so this is another thing to keep in mind when looking at networks and network systems. 
uh, transformations. So a transformation is that product or that that information or material that's moving through a network. Um, sometimes the transformations happen within nodes, but sometimes it happens between nodes. And so what I mean by that is that uh, once something is transmitted from one location to another, it might change form or meaning. And so in this case, what, what that means is, is, let's take example of the Amazon delivery guy. Uh, when, the, when your package is in the Amazon delivery truck, it is cargo. Once it arrives to you, it, it, you know, the, the cargo status changes, and now it is transformed into a product or a delivered good. Um, so that's what I mean by transformations. In other cases, uh, the way that information is handled changes as it moves through a network. So for instance, uh, your email might be encrypted while it's in transit. And so in that case, it's just uh, it, it's an encrypted payload. But then once it gets to you, the content of the email is transformed in, and it's decrypted. Um, and then it, it takes on an entirely new meaning. So constraints. Uh, interfaces often have constraints such as time, distance, or throughput, uh, which is, so in this case, like it takes time to deliver the package from the Amazon warehouse to you, or it takes time to deliver the email from one place to another, depending on the size of the attachments. So that's what I mean by constraints. So these are usually time, energy, material, throughput, those sorts of things that constrain the individual linkages between nodes. And then finally, protocols. So protocols, as I alluded to briefly earlier, Protocols are the uh, the rules governing the way that those transitions happen. So this might be a little bit confusing and abstract to you, but think about handoffs within your company. So if you have a product or a project that is that is getting uh, fired up, you have certain protocols about like, okay, who's responsible for what at what time? So a RACI matrix, if you're familiar with that, that is an example of protocols about interfaces. Who is responsible for what, when, and at what time? Uh, Gantt charts and burn down charts are also examples of protocols where you say, hey, there is a series of operations or a series of events that must happen as this work product uh, is developed, such as a new software application or service that your company is offering. Boundaries. So a boundary in this case is the edge of a network system. So basically that is the sphere of influence that that network has domain over. Uh, so uh, there's a few other things to think about is the perme permeability or plasticity of those boundaries. So is it easy to add and remove nodes from a network? If, if yes, then it is high permeability, which means that it can accept stuff into the network. So social media networks are high permeability where pretty much anyone can come and go as they please. Uh, whereas a factory floor is low permeability because you actually put systems in place, physical systems to preserve the structure and integrity of that network. Likewise, logistics supply chains, they are permeable, but you don't want them to be permeable. And so, for instance, maintaining supply chain integrity is actually an entire discipline unto itself. Um, influence, adaptability, and constraints, we've already kind of talked about those, so I don't think that I need to go back over them. But the point here is that when you're thinking about networks, you need to think about the boundaries of those networks, and most importantly, the uh, permeability uh, or, or vulnerability of those network systems. Okay, so that was a really fast crash course in networks. For a quick recap, there are networks, which is just an interconnected uh, set of components with linkages and relationships, and you take a holistic view looking at it as a whole. Uh, then there's nodes within the network, which is the individual elements or components with their own identities, functions, roles, uh, rules, and states within the network. Uh, there's interfaces, which is the, the actual connections between nodes in the network, and so the Taking a, a step back, a network is just the nodes and interfaces. So that's what I mean by interface. And interfaces are governed by the type of, of information, material, or energy being transmitted, the method by which it's being transmitted, and the characteristics of the links. So say, for instance, a chain on a motor is very different from you know, an API call, is very different from word of mouth, and so on and so forth. But these are all different ways of looking at the interfaces within, within a network. And then finally, boundaries, which is the edge of the network, um, which is defined by the sphere of influence. Uh, if a network does not have the ability to influence a node, then that node is outside of the network. So for instance, a, uh, a closed social network, like a private group on Facebook, can only affect the people that are on that Facebook group, but people that are not on that that are not in that domain, that are not in that network, they might not see that information or they might be uh, peripheral nodes because you know some of the information on that network might spread by word of mouth. Uh, but then you can have entirely adjacent networks where you've got network A and network B and there's very little communication between those networks. So that's what I mean by boundaries. All right, now 
Moving forward to network effects, now that you have a mental model of what a network is, let's talk about the aggregate behaviors of networks and ter in terms of uh, behaviors and failure modes. So one failure mode that everyone is familiar with is network congestion. So network congestion is, the, the most familiar example is going to be traffic jams. So traffic jams are networks of roads. And the, the nodes in the uh, network can be seen as the uh, intersections and destinations of the uh, highway system or road system. And then, of course, the, the linkages or connections are the actual roads uh, and interchanges that allow cars to, to be transmitted across that network. Now, cars, you might say those, those are nodes, but I would say that actually in, from a network systems thinking, cars are actually the material being transmitted across the network. And so there's resource limitations, such as bandwidth. You can think of the throughput of a highway system as a function of its width, right? So an eight-lane highway is going to have a higher throughput than a two-lane highway or a one-way dirt road. Uh, so when you have network congestion, uh, basically you have decreased throughput because the load is greater than the capacity. Um, this also increases latency, meaning transmit time uh, or transit time is longer than it otherwise should be. You, another effect that you get is queuing. So uh, queuing is basically when you're waiting at the stoplight or you're waiting to get on the highway uh, because the network is currently overloaded. And then finally, one of the most important things to think about here in, in terms of network congestion is feedback loops. So there, there are some feedback loops that are self-correcting, meaning that uh, you know a, a sufficiently sophisticated highway system will have alternative routes which means that, you know, hey, here's a, here's a sign that says, you know, this, this road is congested, use a detour. Uh, so being able to reroute things is a way to alleviate network congestion. But in many cases, that's not available. And so what you have is knock-on or ripple effects that actually make the, make the situation get worse over time. So an example, obviously, everyone's familiar with, uh, with traffic jams. But from storage networking, there is this, this phenomenon called slow drain, which basically means that uh, <laughs> when, when your storage network is trying to transmit too much data, if you have a node that is causing a backup, you end up with this ripple effect that is felt everywhere else in the network because everyone is having to wait their turn. And you end up with these really weird exponential decays of uh, transmit time, which again, this is why sometimes you're on the highway. And even though there's, there's a lot of cars on the highway, Everyone is still going 60 or 70 miles an hour, but with just 5% more cars, everyone slows down to 30 miles an hour. So that's what I mean by an exponential decay in performance, and that is a knock-on or ripple effect. And that, that honestly is, is very, very similar to a slow drain phenomenon. And you can see this, this, uh, these sets of network effects in all kinds of networks. Supply chains, this is why we had uh, really big uh, supply chain meltdowns during the pandemic, as an example. Viral effects. So viral effects are particular, generally particular to um, high-velocity networks uh, where basically you have an exponential spread of information, uh, behaviors, or other contagions within a network. So information can spread very quickly. Um, and, and then, of course, we all just survived a pandemic. Uh, and so you can see exponential growth in, in these. But how does that happen? You have a high transmission rate. So that's the number one thing is whatever the method is, you have a high transmission rate. But the way that this happens is what's called network amplification, where each node can create more new nodes. And so say, for instance, the rate of infection is each node can infect five new nodes per day. But then, uh, the, you know, so you start with one node and then the following day you have five new nodes and then the following day you have 25 new nodes, so on and so forth. So that's what I mean by viral effects. And of course, this was uh, noted at the onset of YouTube and Twitter and other social media things where there was this, this new information viral phenomenon. Another thing is that it happens in a short period of time. Uh, but also what you can have is you can have what's called a saturation point where basically the information has spread as far as it's going to uh, or the disease or whatever. Uh, and then you start to get diminishing returns or this tapering effect. And this is why you see kind of a bell curve uh, of viral effects on you know YouTube and Twitter and other places, even the spread of viruses within uh, within computer networks. So in my past life as an IT guy, we would see if you had an infestation, it would start very small, but then once it got into the you know right or the, or the wrong places rather, it would spread very quickly. But then it would it would fill up that container, whatever those network boundaries were, those security boundaries, and then it would stop spreading. So that's what I mean by a saturation point. 
And then finally, there are also feedback loops that can that can play into this, such as if you have knock-on effects that cause systemic failures and actually magnify vulnerabilities, or if you have the opposite thing where you can reduce vulnerabilities over time uh, to insulate against viral effects. Induced demand. So this is one of the less intuitive uh, network effects, which is uh, this is really common in cities actually where what happens is uh, there's a there's a city street that's congested, and so what they do is they say, aha, we obviously need to make this one city street wider to accommodate more people. Well, what happens is more people are trying to get onto that city street, but the rest of the system is not actually accommodating the network traffic. <laughs> and so what happens is you end up with these weird bottleneck effects that is called induced demand, where rather than looking at the, the grid as a whole, whether it's a city street uh, or a power grid or a computer network or whatever... Uh, if you look at just one choke point and don't look at the whole system, you might actually create induced demand where everyone's now trying to go through the one gate that you keep making wider. But really what you need to do is have alternative paths or al alternative routes. And so again, this, this, uh, some of it comes down to perceived efficiency because it's like, oh, hey, I'm just going to take this road because it's convenient to get to, but everyone thinks the same way. And so it's like, well, if everyone's making the decision to take one road because there's no good alternatives, that road is always going to be the most congested. So that's an example of induced demand. Network equal equilibrium. So equilibrium is basically a network either will reach uh, stability or instability, and it will have some intrinsic structures and rules that either lead it towards stability or instability. So self-regulation, uh, these are ways that networks can be self-stabilizing. So this, uh, so self-regulation might be uh, cutoffs or uh, breaks or other kinds of friction that prevent things from spiraling out of control. So in the past, in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s, there have been cases of massive, massive power grid failures because they were, um, they were intrinsically unstable, meaning that if uh, you know, one major station failed, all the rest tried to take the loads and there was no self-correction mechanisms that made it, uh, made it self-stabilizing. So some of these instability triggers can be things like uh, node failures or linkage failures. So for instance, if, uh, if any network doesn't have the ability to reroute, um, then you're going to try and fit everything through the only remaining routes, which means that you're going to have really horrible congestion. Um, there's uh, other external interventions that can be done, such as you know shutting off the power. You know, if, <laughs> rather than have more power stations melt down, maybe you just turn off the power until you fix the problem. You can also add in fail safes and other things that react to those failure conditions in order to make your network more prone towards stability rather than instability. And then uh, another one is forcing functions. So a forcing function is usually uh, some kind of constraint, uh, such as the uh, limited availability of resources uh, or other internal uh, behaviors for individual nodes. And so, for instance, hunger is a really good forcing function. Uh, if you look at yourself as either a node in a network or as a, as a network system yourself, you're a system of organs and you know life and all that sort of stuff, hunger will force you to go uh, solve that problem. So that is... That is a forcing function that will compel you to either go hunting or go to the grocery store or go to a restaurant or ask someone for food. So that's an example of a forcing function. Likewise, if you go to the grocery store and the grocery store is out of food, that is a forcing function of the grocery store to buy, go buy more produce or go buy more goods so that they can sell it. And so these aggregate behaviors of forcing functions that are, um, that are going to be in, in individual nodes, but also in the aggregate behavior of the network, uh, are going to create systemic pressures, feedback mechanisms, and other uh, things that basically force the network to behave in certain ways. And so forcing functions could also be uh, prohibitive. So what I mean by prohibitive is that if, say, for instance, the network gets too hot, you turn it off, that forces it to calm down. Um, so an example of this is going to be in the stock market where you have uh, where you have uh, fail safes that basically if if the you know, the stock market detects a major sell off it actually stops trading and can actually reverse those trades so that's an example of a prohibitive force of forcing function where it says hey we know that you're trying to do these things but we're not going to let you do it so you have inhibitory um, or, or prohibitory forcing functions as well as um, excitatory forcing functions which basically says at a certain point you must do this thing uh, an example of of a of a positive forcing function is um, your kitchen. 
when your kitchen gets too dirty, <laughs> you're forced to clean it up because the kitchen is no longer useful. Uh, so that basically forces a good behavior because your kitchen is dirty, it's too small, you can't use it, and so now you have to engage in a positive behavior, such as cleaning it up. Cascade failures. The cascade failures are similar, or I alluded to cascade failures with the example of the power grid. So in, in other examples of cascade failures, you have economic collapses like the Great Depression. So the Great Depression was a cascade failure that uh, was a combination of all kinds of network effects, um, such as uh, destroyed uh, trust. So the nodes in the network, such as individuals, banks, and corporations, they no longer trusted each other. They didn't trust the government. So there was a lot of mutual suspicion. Uh, and people withdrew from participating in the system as a whole, which caused the system to fully collapse for more than 10 years. And so this, uh, this kind of systemic collapse or cascade failure is kind of what people are afraid of um, in terms of either economic failures, such as Great Depressions or hyperinflation. Uh, you're also going to be afraid of cascade failures in the case of like zombie apocalypse. So zombie apocalypse is, is a thought experiment of a cascade failure of um, you know, society comes unraveled, disease becomes prevalent, uh, and so on and so forth. And but all of this illustrates the interconnectedness of these massive systems with uh, with the potential for breakdowns or disequilibrium or disharmony based on the behaviors of those individual nodes. Okay, so I just threw a heck of a lot at you, and I'm going really fast, so you might need to watch this video a couple times and look up some of these terms. But now you are familiar with these terms, so let's get into network examples so that you're a little bit more familiar with what we mean by all these things. So first, natural ecosystems. So natural ecosystems are composed of many nodes within an environment and a lot of connections between those nodes. So for instance, in this uh, arboreal, this, this forest environment, you have trophic levels such as uh, predators versus autotrophs versus heterotrophs. So you've got uh, carnivores at the top, then you've got herbivores in the middle, and then you've got the, the decomposers and, and autotrophs or plants and fungus at the bottom. And so these trophic levels uh, describe and characterize the connections between the flora and fauna of the environment. But then another uh, set of nodes and interconnections are the hydrological cycles. So the, ra the rain, rivers, and runoff that, uh, are, that basically underpin all of life because all life depends on water. There's other environmental factors that have you know, certain forcing functions. So in this case, a forcing function in the ecological landscape might be uh, rain. Uh, or lack thereof. So if you don't have rain uh, in an environment, that forces certain behaviors or characteristics to arise, such as you know trees will start uh, conserving water, um, they'll breathe less, animals might die off. Uh, conversely, if you have a lot of rain, the environment will respond to that by becoming more lush, more green, uh, there will be more food available, and so then the animals will start to reproduce more, and that sort of thing. And so then we talk about equilibrium versus de disequilibrium. The most healthy, vibrant ecosystems are going to be very resilient, meaning they can tolerate the loss or damage to any particular node or system. Uh, but in some cases, ecosystems are actually very fragile, meaning that uh, so some famous examples are if you lose apex predators, then you will often have cases where the herbivores take over and you can actually destroy entire forests by losing apex predators. And this is a non-intuitive effect because what the apex predators did was they kept the population of the herbivores in check. Um, and then the herbivores, uh, if they're no longer kept in check, they're going to eat all of the plants, all of the saplings, and eventually all the trees will die and the entire ecosystem will fall apart. We also see this uh, if you lose birds. Uh, <laughs> if you lose trees, you lose birds. And if you lose birds, then you, uh, particularly in island ecosystems, uh, the loss of birds can actually cause a complete breakdown of the entire ecosystem. We saw this on Easter Island, actually. Easter Island used to be heavily forested, but the locals harvested all the wood um, for various purposes. And then the seabirds stopped coming, and the seabirds stopped fertilizing the ground. The, the land became infertile, and then the population of the entire island collapsed. So that's what I mean by balance and equilibrium. Uh, within ecosystems. Another example is capital economies. So capital economies, you know, the economic system is something that a lot of people are familiar with, but it is also incredibly large. So there's various nodes within the uh, capital e economic ecosystem, such as governments, consumers, uh, voters, politicians, 
businesses, corporations, other corporations, other nations, uh, trading partners, and those sorts of things. And so this system is mediated, excuse me, this system is mediated by things like monetary policy, fiscal policy, uh, trade policy, and other regulatory agencies and bodies that require certain behaviors or protocols around transactions. Who can sell what to whom, at, at what rate, and how much those things cost, the medium of exchange, uh, whether it's U.S. dollars or euros or you know uh, yuan or whatever, there's all kinds of mechanisms that participate and try and modify the network system of the flow of, of goods, uh, services, and money around the world. But that's fundamentally what's being transmitted in the capital economy is goods, services, and money. Uh, human bodies. So I alluded earlier in this video to the human body as a system or a network. So you you are composed of a system of organs. Uh, you know, your circulatory system, your digestive system, your skin system, your muscular, musculoskeletal system, and so on and so forth. You are, your boundaries are very clear. Your skin is your primary boundary, and that boundary interacts with other systems, including people, the environment, the physical environment, um, as well as the microscopic uh, 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 bacterial environment that you're in. There's inputs and outputs to your body. So you take in uh, nutrients and water and food, and you, uh, you have output, such as the expulsion of waste, uh, carbon dioxide, and excess heat. You also output sound and other things. So you are hearing me speak right now because my, my body system is able to produce meaningful uh, acoustic vibrations that are then picked up by my microphone here um, and then is recorded and transmitted to you via other systems. So I am interacting with several systems right now uh, you know, such as you watching this video, as well as the electronics that are transmitting this information to you. Homeostasis is an example of a system that has built-in equilibria. So what I mean by this is that your body works to maintain its own internal state. So your body maintains its internal temperature, its internal consistency, uh, uh, chemistry, uh, so on and so forth. And so this is an example of a very sophisticated system that has uh, invested a lot of energy and, uh, and structures to maintaining equilibrium rather than disequilibrium. And then, of course, there's models of disease. So uh, disease talks about the, uh, the, the systemic failures that can happen within your system or the vulnerability and permeability of your system. So internal disease, such as uh, cancer and metabolic disease, these are examples of network failures where certain nodes in your body, like maybe your heart isn't working how, how it should or your liver isn't working how it should. So that's an endogenous disease versus an exogenous disease or externally mediated disease, which means that something has come into your body that shouldn't be there, like uh, it might be toxins or bacteria or viruses. And so those are exogenous models of disease. But if you look at it as, uh, as a system, your system is being infiltrated by something external or it is being mediated by an internal failure, that is a way to look at the human body as a system or a network. Uh, corporations. So more specifically, corporations can be viewed as systems uh, or network systems. So the inputs to a corporation are going to be things like uh, labor, capital, material, energy, and data. And then the outputs of, the, uh, of any corporation, there's three primary outputs, which is goods or services and or the payment of taxes and dividends. And so the input is, uh, is you know, labor, capital, material. The output is going to be finished goods and services. And then the output is also usually going to be money of some sort to someone, uh, some kind of stakeholder. There's, there's a lot of internal components or organs within a com uh, company. So you have the HR department, you have the, you know, the C-suite, you have the IT department. So these are all systems within systems. So these are embedded systems or nested systems. And then these, uh, they're all interconnected by you know, circulatory systems or nervous systems within the organization. Uh, and you can look at these either like the systems of a body, or you can look at them like assembly lines. And we'll talk about assembly lines in just a moment. And then finally, like, uh, like any body or any other system, there is waste versus efficiency, which basically businesses are always trying to maximize the output of goods and services uh, by minimizing waste and finding new efficiencies. Assembly lines. So assembly lines are uh, an even more zoomed in view of a network system where basically you have uh, inputs such as material and energy uh, in order to produce a particular good. Uh, you have stations within the assembly line. So uh, these are a kind of node. So a station on an assembly line could be the, um, a person that is assembling things or a person who's painting things or a robot that's automatically welding. 
So stations are nodes that use tools, labor, and energy uh, in order to modify a work product. And then there's conveyances. So conveyances are what are the, the tools and equipment or processes that move work product across an assembly line uh, or move it through the system, transmit it uh, as, in, as uh, information, energy, or material through that. And so the reason that I'm, uh, that I'm saying information or energy is because you can also look at any intellectual uh, behavior in your company as a kind of assembly line. So for instance, you have a software product that you're trying to build. Uh, it's still an assembly line because you have you have uh, you know product folks, you have developers, you have QA, you have uh, all kinds of people working on it at various parts along the life cycle of your software uh, or anything else in the business. Uh, you also have stockpiles. So stockpiles are storage of either raw materials or finished goods that are waiting for conveyance or transit. Um, and then you have backlogs. So backlogs are uh, you know queues or schedules of orders of work that is waiting to be done. So this is a way of looking at assembly lines as a network system as well. So thanks for watching. I know I threw a lot at you all at once, but I also have a link in the description to my Medium article on the same thing, which will give you the same information, but you can take a little bit more time to digest it. I hope you got a lot out of this episode of Systems Thinking, specifically about networks. Like, subscribe, and consider supporting me on Patreon. Thanks for watching to the very end. Have a good one.